Yeah, it's the last week of class here, just three more lectures. Our last lecture will be lecture 38. And then we have our final exam next week. So this section, you have your final exam next Monday morning, right, Marilee? The official start time is 8.15, but I'd like to give you a little extra time, so we, I will be here ready for you to go at 8 if you like a little extra time. You come at 8. It is 20% of your overall grade, which is higher than any individual thing. Uh, well, yeah, each midterm 16%, homework in total is 25%, meaning each individual homeworks in the ballpark are a little less than 1% of your overall grade. We haven't done any qu more quizzes. We have those quizzes back at the beginning of the semester. That's 15% of your grade. That is done. No more quizzes for you guys, but for future classes, there could be more quizzes. Maybe online quizzes based on lectures or something. Question? Are you going to note card for the final exam? Um, you will be able to use an entire sheet of paper right back to the final exam on your calculator. And thanks for reminding me to say something else about the final. The final exam, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the mini exam, exam one, exam two, pick a random sampling of problems from those exams, put them on the final with changed numbers, maybe check maybe slightly changed wording. For example, true-false questions. If it's true on an old exam, I might change the wording a little bit. It might be false on the final exam. Um, so you will still have to pay attention to wording if I do that. And then there will be some new problems, two or three problems probably, related to differential equations on the final exam as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, Friday is going to be our review day. Yep. Uh, today, the goal is to, first of all, actually work through your problem that was to be done in Mathematica with the printout today. I did get an email from one of the teaching assistants uh, from Math Lab last night telling me that they accidentally told you to do the wrong thing. And there, were, there were some of you that were in Math Lab and they, they thought they told you something wrong after the fact they realized it. I don't know if what they told you was wrong or not. Um, so tell you what I'll do. I'm going to spend lecture A essentially going through that problem as well as talking about some extra stuff related to it. And if you decide after watching lecture A uh, that you want to redo that problem, I will give you an extension on it and you can turn it in tomorrow morning by 9 o'clock if you decide you want to redo it. Okay? Um, Should you just turn it in outside your office then? Yeah, you can bring it to my office. Okay? But maybe you, maybe you feel like you, you, you did fine so you don't need to redo it. Before we get into content, I want to show you a little bit more in the uh, what is calculus section here. Differential equations have a lot of interesting phenomena associated with them. There's something called the butterfly effect that actually sometimes shows up in movies. They talk about the butterfly effect. Even way back at the first Jurassic Park movie, they talked about the butterfly effect. They were sitting in one of the jeeps, and one of the characters was talking to the woman about water dripping on your hand and not knowing which way the drop is going to go and saying that's an instance of the butterfly effect. What does the butterfly effect really say as, in terms of butterflies? It says that if a butterfly flaps its wings somewhere far away, you know, out, way over around the world in China or something, it could affect weather, say, here in Minnesota two weeks later. You know, if the butterfly didn't take off from that flower, Maybe it'll be sunny here two weeks later, and if they do, it's going to be stormy. That slight changes in the initial conditions, the initial conditions in this case being, uh, does, how does the butterfly's flapping its wings affect the airflow, can propagate into big changes over a long time. Is that really right? Well, the point is, theoretically, it is right. Practically speaking, can you really prove that that's the case? Can you prove that if the butterfly took off, it will cause a storm, whereas if they don't, it won't? Probably not. You probably can't prove that, but it's a theoretical possibility is the idea. It's the idea of something called sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And this particular, uh, particular system of differential equations, which I don't have written here, well, I guess you do see it in the MD solve here. It's a system of three differential equations and three unknowns, x, y, and z, involving a bunch of parameters, a, a sigma, a rho, and a beta. It's called the Lorentz system. It satisfies um, 
sensitive dependence on the initial conditions, meaning if you change the initial condition ever so slightly, it can drastically affect the long-term behavior. This is a picture of something called the Lorentz attractor. Um, we've got a three-dimensional picture here. If I let time go by here, we'll see a solution curve going through three-dimensional space because it's a system of three differential equations and three unknowns. And that solution curve has pretty interesting behavior. It even looks kind of like butterfly wings, which is another reason why this kind of goes with the butterfly effect. That's the parametric curve in three-dimensional space. The corresponding graphs of x, y, and z as functions of time are down here. And you can see they're kind of crazy looking. If I change an initial condition ever so slightly, like if I change the initial z value here, um, you're still going to see a pretty, you know, you're know, you going to see a similar picture up here. And still lots of ups and downs down here. But the exact nature of the ups and downs, for example, this sort of spot in here where the ups and downs are not quite as big an amplitude, probably will change drastically, I'm guessing. Change Z0 even just a little bit. Watch that spot over here especially. Let's see if it happens. Yep, change pretty drastically over here. You see the same overall pattern of this butterfly-like shape. It's called the Lorentz attractor in three-dimensional phase space. And you still see lots of up and down jaggedness of the individual functions involved. But the, the intricate, delicate behavior, like trying to predict the weather two weeks from now, is just very hard to do. You can't say exactly what's going to happen so well. Like change y0 a little bit, we'll see another change. For example, something interesting here, seeing the blue here and the blue down there. Will that change pretty radically if I change y a little bit? A little bit. Not super radical, but yeah, I mean, changes, even small changes, arbitrarily small changes, in fact, in these initial conditions can radically affect what happens. And that essentially says long term weather prediction, at least beyond general trends, is not really possible. I mean, yeah, you can say it's going to be warmer in the summer and cooler in the winter, of course. But, you know, to say the high next June 21st is going to be 97 degrees, that's not really possible. Okay. Or whether it's going to rain or not. Um, this is actually related to my research that I did for my PhD, my doctorate. When you do a doctorate in math, you either have to solve a problem nobody's ever solved before, come up with a new technique that nobody's ever come up with before, or come up with an entirely new framework or theory that nobody's ever come up with before, or else maybe work with other people on that same framework or theory. Um, probably the easiest one is what I did, is to come up with a new technique or something. That's probably the easiest one. Uh, and it was related to uh, what's called bursting behavior in electrical activity across cell membranes, in particular in your pancreas. There are these things called beta cells that produce insulin. And their electrical activity, their voltages across their membranes, you know, it oscillates up and down, as you might expect, as ions flow back and forth across the membrane. And you can model that. And this, for example, is what the solutions look like. They exist, they exhibit what's called bursting behavior. Uh, down here is the three-dimensional picture, and you can see it's kind of cool looking. In fact, I even made this my Facebook, not my, what's the background picture called? Cover photo. Cover photo. I made my, my Facebook cover photo once, except I turned it the other way. Uh, indicating sort of rapid oscillations in the variables, where you see this bursting, these periods of rapid oscillations in the variables interspersed with periods where they don't change much. So here the voltage across the cell membrane is not changing very much, and all of a sudden it spikes really, really rapidly. And what they found is those spikes correspond to the pancreatic, pancreatic beta cells producing insulin. And if you know about diabetes, you know that's um, a disease where they're having trouble with the insulin production in the pancreas. And so that's, that's related to that. I didn't know a ton about the biology. I mostly just worked with the math. 
my understanding of the biology and the chemistry is just sort of intuitive, basically just what I told you just there. Um, but the math, I got into the details of it. So it was related to differential equations. All right, so what we want to do here is a linear system. In fact, the linear system from your homework problem, it's phase plane, and an introduction to something called null claims, which is a topic for section 11.9, which is our last section of the book we're going to do. So the, um, the system of differential equations for that problem is dx dt equals negative x minus 3y, I think, let me double check this, is that right? Negative Negative x minus 3y, dy dt is uh, 3x minus y. That's your system of differential equations. Then we've got a couple initial conditions in here. x of 0 equals 2, y of 0 equals 1. There's your system of differential equations, and here's your initial conditions. Together, these do make an i dt, an initial value problem if you put all four equations together. I would like to think about this system by hand before we use Mathematica and introduce the concept of something called the null claim. And for any two-dimensional system like this, there are always two null claims. What you do is you make your xy plane, that's going to be your phase plane, solutions live in the phase plane, right? There are a pair of bunch of curves that go around the phase plane as time goes by. The origin is the only equilibrium point for the system. Certainly, if x and y are both 0, the right-hand sides become 0. So you make a big dot at the origin. That represents one solution that's really a constant function. It's a pair of bunch of curve that stays at one point for all time. And there are actually no other solutions. If you set these equal to 0, it would, it would imply that x and y have to both be 0. It's just a matter of solving that system of equations. So the origin is the only equilibrium point. We're concerned with the solution that starts at the point 2, 1. Starting right there, there's our initial condition. Let me make this dot really big and make that dot kind of small. That's an equilibrium point. This is just a starting point of my solution for the initial value problem. What I'd like to do is I'd, try to, I'd like to try to approximate what the solution is going to look like without technology, without Mathematica. I'm going to give names to these right-hand side functions. And these aren't functions. They're functions of two variables. So this is going to be another introduction aspect to multivariable calculus here. So functions of two variables, you could call this f of xy and this g of xy. In fact, I did that in Mathematica last Friday. I used that kind of notation in Mathematica, at least. Here I'm doing it by hand. Multivariable calculus is, as the name implies, about calculus with multiple, multiple variables. In fact, multiple independent variables in this case x and y can go into these functions. One important thing to do with such functions is figure out where they're zero. That's commonly an important thing to do in math is figure out where things are zero. That is the case here. Where is f of x, y equal to zero, for example? f of x, y equals zero. That's going to be where negative x minus 3y is zero which, if you solve for y, is where y is negative one-third x. Zoom in on that if you need to. Along that line, through the origin, with a slope of negative one-third, that's where this function f of x, y, which is the right-hand side of the dx t differential equation, is zero. This function is defined on the entire plane gives you another quantity, another output that would be in another dimension, maybe, maybe coming out of the plane. Like a z-axis coming out of the plane. I think the output's that way. 
you wanted to. But here we're just we're interested in where it's zero. It's zero along this line. So if I draw a line in here to the origin with a slope of negative one third, so it would look about like, let's be a little careful here. It would look about like this. Felt like that? That's where f of x, y, the right hand side of the, the x to k equation is 0. Where is the right hand side positive and where, it's neg where is it negative? This is where it's 0. Evidently, probably, it's going to be positive on one side of that line and negative on the other side. Plug in any point up here above this line into the f of x func of y function. And think about it briefly, you're going to get a negative number. Up here, f of x, y, above that line, f of x, y is negative. Try a point like 1, 1. Plug in x is 1, y is 1, you get negative 4. The right hand side is negative 4 at the point 1, 1. Plug in a point below this line, like negative 1, comma negative 1, you get a positive number when you plug it in. Down here, f of x, y is positive below the line. That has implications for solutions of the differential equation. Solution curves of the differential equation are parametric curves that move around the plane as time goes by. Their first component of their velocity, so to speak, the velocity vector of the curve, is the x t which is negative up there and positive down there, meaning the motion of the curve has to be to the left up here and to the right down here. And evidently when it crosses this line, this null line is what it's called, null because we're setting the function equal to zero. Null kind of stands for zero. Null line, where that null line is zero, that's where I guess Hmm, the x dt is zero, so I guess solution curves would have to cross this line with a vertical tangent. So if you make a bunch of little line segments, vertical line segments along that line, that reminds you that solutions have to cross that with a vertical tangent. The velocity vector has to be either pointing straight up or pointing straight down as you cross that line. The moment, the instant you cross that line. Just for one instant, though. You can do the same thing for g. g of x, y equaling 0 is equivalent to 3x minus y equaling 0, which is equivalent to y equals 3x, aligned with the slope of positive 3 going to the origin. A line that looks about like this. That's where g of x, y is 0. Don't get it mixed up with the f of x, y being negative up there. That's not along this line. That's above the blue line that f of x, y is negative. g of x, y is 0 along this green line. And where is it positive and where it's negative? There's a negative plug in points. For example, you can plug in the point x is 1, y is 0 into this to get a positive number to see over here to the right of the green line, g of x, y is positive. And to the left of the green line, g of x, y is negative. So solution curve, since g of x, y is the right-hand side of the dy dt equation, which is the second component of the velocity vector for the curve, solution curves are going to be going up when g of x, y is positive over here to the right of the green line, and down when g of x, y is negative to the left of the green line. And you'd have to cross with a horizontal tangent, dy dt is 0, along the green line. So you can make a bunch of little horizontal lines things like that. And in between, you can emphasize to yourself, okay, 
Over here, I guess f is negative and g is positive. f is the dx of t equation, g is the right hand side of the dy of t equation. If f is negative, g is positive. That means solutions have to go to the northwest. I drew three arrows there. This arrow pointing up emphasizes that g is positive, so dy dt is positive. This arrow pointing left is emphasizing that f is negative, so dx dt is negative. So the resulting motion of the parametric curve is to the northwest. Maybe I should just draw the, the northwest vector now. Do a similar kind of thing in these other quadrants. Over here, the motion of solution curves is going to be southwest. Over here, it's going to be southeast. And over here, it's going to be northeast. They're going to spiral. And that's what you should have seen when you made your graph. Let's go ahead now and start at this initial condition and try to approximate what the solution curve will look like. It's got to go to the northwest here, up and to the left. It's got to cross that green line with a horizontal tangent. So it's got to kind of curve about like this. Then it's in this sector right over here where motion of solution curves is to the southwest. Down and left. So it's got to go down this way. And you're kind of forced by the nature of this thing to seemingly be going toward the origin here. By the nature of these long lines how you got to cross them. It seems like you're, you're kind of forced to head toward the origin. Now, you could, I could be deceiving myself in seeming, looking at this and saying, it seems like I'm kind of forced to go toward the origin. If you're not drawing it carefully, it's easy to deceive yourself. But I did check this with Mathematica. In fact, I constructed the system to make that happen. There's what your solution curve looks like. I think for your homework, for time two, t equals two, I think you ended up down right around there. So I think your position vector should have been about like this. Your velocity vector at time two should have been about like this. And I'm guessing your acceleration vector was probably something like this. Let's go ahead and use Mathematica and see what you should have gotten. <coughs> And again, if you want to redo your homework, you can redo this one problem, I mean. It is just this one problem. You can have a whole, whole assignment. Let's have Mathematic add the null lines in there as well. So I'm going to define my right-hand side functions. These right-hand side functions are important things, right? We, we use them to make slope fields. Now we're using them to make vector fields. I didn't you know, bother making the vector field on the board besides those four black arrows are just rough approximations of the arrows in the vector field. I can draw a pretty good thick picture without the vector field. So f of x, y is negative x minus 3y. g of x, y is uh, 3x minus y. Um, Let's go ahead and first make the, the vector field. And then after we hit the vector field, we, and with the NOAA planes in there, say, confirming what we see in the board, then we'll also use d cell value to get the solution curve and put that in there and put the vectors in there as well, position vector, velocity vector, and acceleration vector. All right, so let's see. I'm going to do. More than one graphics command. I'm going to use vector plot for this for the vector field. I want to draw those lines too. I could use plot and plot the functions 3x and negative one third x. That might be the simplest thing to do. However, I want to show you another command called contour plot instead. In fact, I'm going to do that, do that one first. Contour plot is going to come first. Um, let me make a contour plot of just one of these functions first. So this is not going to be what I, what I leave in here as my final typing. But 
initially. I want to just do this, say, from negative 4 to 4 for x and negative 4 to 4 for y. If you're just doing the conjure plot, you actually don't need the show. I'll leave it there anyway. It doesn't hurt. What do we see? See a bunch of lines with different colors. Um, these lines have a lot of slope of negative one third. Where this function equals a constant, call that constant c. That's what we're seeing is for this line, this function equals different constants. Negative x minus 3y equals a constant c. Solving that for y, that's equivalent to y equaling negative 1 third x minus c over 3. Got a couple steps in my head there. Added y, 3y to both sides, subtracted c from both sides, and divided everything by 3. Line with the slope of negative 1 third and a vertical intercept of negative c over 3. You don't see the axes in here. I mean, get rid of the frame and put the axes in it. For example, this line here, which, by the way, if I put the cursor on it, shows negative 5. What is that? That's the output of this function along that line. Saying this function's values along that line is negative 5. C is negative 5 for that line. Its vertical intercept itself should be positive 5 thirds. If C is negative 5, the vertical intercept here should be positive 5 thirds. Positive 1 and 2 thirds. There's 2, there's 1, 1.5, 1.75. Yeah, that's 1 and 2 thirds. C is negative 5, the intercept is positive 5 thirds. Try another one. Try this one. C is negative 10. That's the output of that function along that line. C is negative 10 implies the intercept is positive 10 thirds, positive 3 and 1 third. Hold on, I just have a question. There's 3, just a second here. There's 3.25. This is 3 and 1 third. What's your question? So, so if the equation is negative 1 third x minus c over 3, how then do we get a positive result? Because if c is negative, then negative oh, c, oh, c is, is negative in that case. Yep, okay. see a negative 10. But along this line, the function's outputs are negative 10. Okay. Along this line through the origin, the function's outputs are 0. Which shouldn't be surprising. You plug in 0, you plug in the origin, you get 0. It's got to be 0 along that line. And that is the null line that we're talking about here, where f equals 0. That's the blue line here. If I want to just plot that one line, I can use contra plot as well. Put w equals 0 in here, and it will just plot the one line. There we go. There's the null line. Actually, you know what? I should put the vector plot first. I want to put this plot on top of the vector plot. Well, let me go ahead and plot the, the null line for g. Where does that equal zero? There it is. There's the line going through the origin of the slope positive three. Yeah, I think we should do the slope field first so that these lines show up on top of that. Vector plot, make slope fields and vector fields. For the vector field, I want the right-hand side functions in here. That's how you make the vector field. Without any extra scaling options, we'll see vectors of different sizes, which is informative. It's telling us, maybe I'll leave it like this this time, and not make it a direction field, not make them all the same size. And by the way, for your printout, you can do either one. You can make them different sizes, or you can make them the same size with the vector scale option that I showed you. Wow. So what does it mean by it being bigger? Why does Mathematica? Why are these longer than yeah. these? Or larger. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and take an example of a point here. Like, what is the vector field at the point 2, 1, right about there, compared to the vector field at the point, oops, right about here, compared to the vector field at the point 4, 1? 
These functions give you the horizontal and vertical components of the vector field. Um, you can think of not only a point with point notation, but you can think of a vector with vector with point notation. F of 2, 1, comma G of 2, 1. Plug the point into these formulas. When x is 2, y is 1, I get negative 2 minus 3 is negative 5. That's f of 2, 1. And when x is 1, excuse me, when x is 2 and y is 1 here, I get 6 minus 1 is 5. I get positive 5. So the vector in the vector field at that point has got components negative 5, positive 5, which means it's an arrow pointing up and to the left, pointing to the northwest, horizontal component negative 5, vertical component positive 5. The true vector in the vector field, there's a displacement of negative 5. A displacement of positive 5 would be off the board up there. The true vector in the vector field at this point shoots up off this way off the board with a horizontal displacement of negative 5 and a vertical displacement of positive 5. At this point, the vector is longer because you can see, well, it's scaled longer in Mathematica, but if you also plug the, the numbers into the functions to find the components of the vector in the vector field, that's how you find these things. Plug in x is 4 and y is 1 here, you're going to get negative 4 minus 3 is negative 7. Plug in x is 4 and y is 1 here, you get 12 minus 1 is 11. The vector in the vector field here has a horizontal displacement of negative 7, so it's going to be leftward-wise the same distance as this one, or to the same vertical line, I should say. 7 units that way, and 11 units up. So it goes up higher, and because the second component is bigger in absolute value than the first one, it points a bit more to the north than it does to the west. It's going to go off the board up that way, and it's going to be longer than this one. That's the idea. The length of the vectors can be found with the Pythagorean theorem. The length of this one would be square root of 25 plus 25, 5 squared plus 5 squared, square root of 50, a little bit bigger than 7. The length of this one would be square root of 7 squared is 49, 11 squared is 121. This is the square root of 170, which is between, well, a little bit bigger than 13. So it's almost twice as long. Is the idea. That's the idea behind how you create these vectors in the vector field, which I know I haven't really talked about before. Um, so I'm doing it very briefly here today. I'll probably talk about it more on Wednesday you can actually plot vectors in the vector field by yourself. Going quick so that I can get to, to more things here. Um, I should probably add the dot at the origin here. List plot. Make it kind of big. Plot style. I like making it black as well. Black. Come up point size is the way to make it bigger. The point zero 0.03, by the way, I think I mentioned this in the other class, but not yours, makes the diameter of the dot 3% of the diameter of the entire picture. If you made it, for example, 0.25, then the diameter of the dot would be a quarter of the diameter of the entire picture, real big dot. Okay, a quarter of the diameter of the entire picture. That's the meaning of the number in there. I typically choose 0 0.03. We're about to take break, the break, but uh, let's just look at the picture. You can see it does match what I drew on the board. These vectors in the vector field are crossing the blue line with vertical tangents, it seems, upwards over here and downwards over there, and crossing the orangish line with horizontal tangents. The blue one is called the x and the line. It's where the x and t is 0. So you've got to cross with the vertical tangent. The orangish one is the y and the line. It's where dy and t is 0. So you have to cross with 
um, you know, vertical component to your velocity vector. Where, where these different node planes cross each other, you have to have an equilibrium point because that's where both dx dt and dy dt are zero. Let's take our break and then we'll come back and continue.